Hi guys, it's Blackie. Okay, today we're going to take a little woods walk. And what we're going to talk about is the gear you're going to need and what you need to be mindful of in the deep south right now at the end of spring, the beginning of summer, what you should be looking for. These are just the thoughts of an old woodsman with a lot of experience in the woods of how I would teach you if you were here with me what to wear and what to do and what to look for as we went along the trail. Now first of all, what the environment we're walking in. You look around here behind me, this is the typical recut woods here in the south. This is where someone has come in and timbered and cut out all the tall timber and all these yo pond and sweet gum and the pioneer species have propped back up. So it's thick brush, prime habitat for snakes because snakes do not do well in our environment in the sun. It being the largest concentration of the poison, excuse me, venomous, y'all always correct me, venomous snakes in the U.S. We've got all of them down here. But the reason that they don't do well is they don't do well in the bare sunlight, so they've got to get out of the sun. The snakes will come out in the morning and they'll warm up and then they'll go get up under briars, up under bushes, up under something because they don't do well in our UV. They overheat easily. And during our summer, the ground temperature can be 140, 150 degrees out there in that field or in the sand. It just bake you. So they want to get all up under this type stuff. That's where they go to survive. So the object of the game here is to know what their habitat is and why they're doing it. So again, early in the morning, they'll be out in the roads, out in the patches of sun, warming up. After it warms up just a little bit, the snake itself does, it's gonna go get up under some of this stuff. When we're trying to walk in this, you cannot see more than, say, six, eight feet in any given direction. You just can't see very far because it is so dense and so many leafy obstructions in your view range. So it's very hard to see them. That's why you carry a stick this time of year. I like something good and stout. This is ironwood, this was in his mind. I want it from about chin to ground level. It's a good prop that way. I cut it so I leave one end larger than the other and I got lucky on this one it started to branch out, so I cut it off and left that wide foot. That's easier to pin a snake's head down. You see that little notch? It's where I can pin a snake's head down with it. I'm not looking to go snake hunting. I'm trying to leave the animal alone so it can fulfill its little life and its little, little destiny. I just don't want to be envenomated when I walk by it. So I need to keep my eyes open to look for that. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. But when I come out into this, what I need to keep my mindset is, is to look up under the bushes. Look for a coiled snake. Those are the snakes that are going to strike. Snakes laying stretched out can only strike a very short distance. Coiled snakes can launch much farther. Those are normally an alert snake or a snake that has chosen to go to sleep. It will coil up like that, put its head on top of a pile and go to sleep. It's hoping a bunny rabbit or a chipmunk will walk by so it can get a quick meal. Our problem is we can't see it. So as we step over that log, we put our foot down right next to it and it wakes up and it strikes. Or a copperhead. I live at the boundary mark between the eastern and western copperhead. The basic difference for people that don't know is one's kind of shiny and one's kind of dull in color. There are other subtle little differences why they call them two different makes, but to us, one's shiny and one dull, eastern and western. And they act the same. They trust their camouflage so much, they just lay there. Well, you come walking up and you will not see it laying in the leaves, especially deep leaves on some of these wooden paths, and you step on it and it strikes you. So we'll deal about strikes here in a little bit. But for right now, what you need to understand in the mindset is, when we walk along, we're looking for snake, we're looking for other things we don't want to come in and bother, such as, use your ears. It's spring. Everything's in mating season right now. Why would you use ears? Listen for that low buzzing sound. Like that. See a little bitty hole over there and you've got a handful of bees or something around it? Yeah. 
You need to avoid that. It's called a yellow jacket nest. Trust me, they will light you up. There'll be a little bitty hole about the size of a number two pencil and four or five hovering around it. Their job is to drive air down that hole. There may be a thousand inside that hole. And when you make them mad, they're all coming after you. So you gotta use your ears. Listen for that buzzing sound. Listen for the buzzing of a rattlesnake. Listen for the sound of something moving in the leaves. Listen to something shifting over there. Always use your ears. Use your sense of smell. Do I suddenly smell something kind of stink? What is that? Sometimes when these big snakes are hot and they get mad, or they're, mad's the wrong term. We used to say mad in the field, but what it meant was they're upset by something, whatever. They give off a smell. And once you smelt it and you know it, you'll know what it is. And if you get around people that are, herp I believe it's herpetologists, I'm probably using that correct incorrectly, but people that handle snakes and have pet snakes, ask them about it. And you'll probably get an opportunity to smell what that smell is. Once you smell it, you'll never forget the smell of an angry, angry timber rattler. And there's other creatures like skunks. <laughs> Skunk don't want to spray you. He just wants to be left alone. But he'll do it if he feels threatened. So if you spot one, instantly go calm. Go chill out immediately. Just stop and look off in another direction. Don't even look at him. And then go off in another way. 99 times out of 100, he won't spray you. Usually when they spray is because they feel threatened and you went in their direction or they thought you were coming at him. He spot him and you look dead at him. And he thought you were coming after him. So if I see him over there, me I go, oh, that's a skunk. And I move on. I've been within feet of them many times and they've not sprayed me. I've been sprayed, but it was always because I'd look up and be like, oh, it's a skunk. I'd be looking dead at it and he'd turn around and shoot because I was looking at it. And therefore I seem to be like a predator looking at a prey. He feels threatened. See, know the animal. All right, let me change the location. We'll get set up for a little walk. Okay, guys, now let's talk about clothing a minute. I talked about a little of it in the intro, but let's talk about it. A big hat. A big hat's got multiple uses, and I did a video just on that about how the hat can be used as a sunshade, how it's good for deflecting and keeping things from jobbing you in the eyes when you're going through such thick cover like I'm in all the time, where things come and hit you. It's a handy thing if I end up with a snake in a tree, I can do that and give me a shield to kind of keep it off of me until I get out of range, and that has happened. Um, in the height of the summer when everything is so hot, my hat is a crushable felt. I'll soak it in water and get her in the creek and just get her sopping wet and sling off the excess and put it back on my head. It'll act like a wet towel on my head for hours and help cool me. So that's a big advantage to me. Next is some sort of, I don't have it on right now, but some sort of neckerchief or something is real handy. Same thing, I can dunk it in water and put it around my neck. It also keeps things from crawling down in my collar and things like that as I'm moving through the brush. A loose fitting shirt. Now, I've had several people ask what these shirts are. And for those young guys that don't recognize them, these are Vietnam era U.S. Army jungle fatigues. It's a ripstop poplin. You can still buy reproductions of them today. I bought mine for a dollar a piece back when they were in surplus. But I love the fit of them and the fact they've got the big cargo pockets and they angle outward. It's easier to get into when you're carrying straps and gear like I am now. It's easier to get into that pocket than a vertical pocket. I can put my hand into that easier and get to my stuff easier. It's also very loose fitting because it's meant for the jungles of Vietnam. So when you roll fans, and that's a big thing because you're sweating like a pig in my heat. And because of that, that water is running down and I want it to air. That does the uh, shirt will also become saturated water and act like a cooling towel after a while. Now, pants. I want something. I like military cargo pants. You know, if you watch my channel, you know that. I like them because they're durable. They've got double knees on them already. Most of them have it where like this one where you can pop this open. A lot of people don't even know this is here. But then there's a pocket right here with a Velcro seam in it. And I don't 
think I can open this with my thumbs right now. It, it's hammered down so tight. But there's a knee insert that goes in there that you can slide it in there and have a knee pad in the bag if you needed to to help you when kneeling down on stuff or whatever. But this one will come open. That'll work. There. See, double knee. So now I got a pocket right there that I can put a pad into if I'm going to be kneeling a lot or whatever. Roomy, loose fitting clothing. As I walk, I want it to fan. I want air circulation. See, because I'm sweating a lot. So I want that water to drain away, go downhill. Boots, ticks. I want my pants be where I can gather them up at the ankle if I've got bad ticks in the area. If I'm finding ticks every few minutes, I'm going to gather these up, pull it tight, stuff it down in the top of my boot. That's going to stop them having direct access there and forces them to crawl up on the outside a lot farther. More likely I'll find them. Okay? Now since my shirt does not tuck into my pants, that means that when they get up, to point X, I should feel them. Remember, I'm wet and sweaty. I should feel them trying to crawl on my wet back. It'll feel like a leaf or something stuck. And I'm quite often I'll feel them back here on the back, and I'll reach back there and I'll catch them before they can attach to me on the back. <coughs> it's just something that worked in Vietnam, and it does work in the semi-tropical jungles of Alabama as well. That way, I've got airflow. I've got a way of capping it off, and I've got a way of staying out of the briars. Now, there are those that want to go hiking bare-legged. And for several years, I wore shorts a lot. It had some advantages. Yes, it's cooler. Disadvantage, you can't sit down without getting beat, uh, eaten by something. Ants, mosquitoes, ticks, whatever. If it's got bare skin, it's going to get on it. So that was a disadvantage. Another disadvantage was briars or things that this would catch the thorns that would just dig into you Okay, and then finally of course snakes. We'll get to that in a minute now boots I wear military type thick boots and I wear a bigger than normal boot My shoe size is nine. I wear a ten and then I'll go and put on heavy socks underneath it What that does is it gives me additional padding because I want that when I'm sweating, that sock's going to get sopping wet no matter what I do. So a wool blend sock, what I prefer, a hiking wool blend sock, will not lose its shape and end up being a wad in the bottom of your boot. You know what I mean? It rubs blisters. It'll avoid that. In the worst part of the year, if I'm going to go on any kind of range hiking, I'll take a nylon dress sock, put it on, and then I'll put that heavy wool sock over, and the two will slide. This will allow me to walk easily with very little friction and keep from having blisters. At the same time, that sweat that's running down my legs can be absorbed by that wool and I can always wring it out, wash it, etc. I will always carry extra socks on the hike or camp out. Bet on it. When I'm camping, I'm going to be carrying an extra complete suit of clothes. I probably have a light t-shirt, a light pair of shorts, and fresh socks. And I'll have some little pair of flip-flop or something for at camp. I'm not hiking. I got done got everything set up. I'm relaxing. I'm in my mosquito net then. It's hot. I want as much air as I can get around me, even inside that mosquito net. I've even talked about carrying a little box fan, battery-powered fan to pressurize it and try to cool me off. So I want some sort of air movement. And so I need that extra set of clothes to change out of these sopping wet clothes. Once we get to our campsite and set up, it's just miserable laying there and sopping wet. You know, they're just covered in sweat clothing. I've got up in the mornings before where I had to wear these clothing, and all the seams were white, and that was salt coming out of me. Now, another reason I like them big, heavy boots is for snake. Now, let us understand a little bit about the snake stripe. Snake's fangs are not designed like a saber-toothed cat. He does not strike and bury his fangs all the way to the end unless he has to. Most of the creatures that he encounters, it's just he pierces his skin and he injects. It's too dangerous for him to harpoon into the flesh 
deep into the muscle tissue of an animal, like a bunny or whatever, because when they jump, it could snap off his fangs, leaving him without his, his most vital equipment to feed himself. So they develop where they strike and just pierce under the skin good and let it go. The, the fangs do not face forward, they face backwards. So he comes up and when he hits, he had, ratchets his head back. When he hits, he rolls and he pulls back until he feels it pierce underneath and then he injects. Usually not very deeply. It pow and he hits and he comes off. The grab strike, he doesn't even in, use his fangs for that. He just grabs like the full head and grabs and he's using the side gripper teeth then like a boa constrictor does to bite and bite then. But he quite often doesn't use his fangs for that. It's too big a danger for him. All bets are off if you step on him because he may use his big fangs, he may not. It's just whatever. So whenever he throws those fangs up and he sticks, he's trying to pierce under the skin and inject. Well, these boots are relatively soft. You know, they're good Condura nylon with leather around it, and then there's a good thick padding of, uh, of warmth padding on it, and then I've got a big, big thick sock. Odds are when he hits, he's gonna go down and go into the padding and inject, not in me, but in the padding. It's uh, not perfect, but beats nothing. I have a pair of knee-high leather boots, and if we're going in certain areas that I can take you to, we're gonna be wearing knee-high leather boots, and you're gonna get struck repeatedly. Um, me and Francis McGowan walked through a place called Hells of Poppin one time over in Connecticut National Forest because he wanted to show me something. And I got struck seven times, he got struck a little over eight times as we walked through. And us looking, knowing what to look for, and still we got struck because there were that many of them in that area. Yeah. It, it feels like somebody slapped you with a hammer. But he couldn't penetrate those heavy snake boots. But, you know, uh, it, oh, it makes your heart stop when it happens. So what do we do? We look for the environment that they live in. We realize what the animal is thinking and why it's doing what it's doing. And we try to mitigate that with our clothing and our actions. My clothing being big baggy pants he may strike it and not hook me just hook the pants and I've had that before sorry for the wind okay walking along this track right here see all this ground nice and muddy and soft and easy and right there you got water flowing in going to that bigger waterway right yonder See all this low, swampy ground right here and over here on the other side of the road? Even more of it. Now, not only snakes that we got to think about, but how about this? It's also mating season for alligator. And them Alabama dinosaurs, what they'll do is mama will come up into a sandbar, a secluded area like this, some place where the ground's fairly soft. And she's going to get a place that she feels safe. And she's going to get up there and she's going to dig her out a hole with the back legs and she's going to put her eggs into it. And then she's going to carefully and meticulously cover it up. And then she's going to hopefully be able to get in the water right there. She's not going to be far from that water, but she might be six, eight, ten feet away. It just how the topography lands, but she'll be in line of sight. And she's going to sit there the next 30 days or whatever, watching it, 90 days, whatever it takes, whatever the gestation is of an alligator. She's going to stay there. And you come cutting through this, exploring, and you'll hear a sound. And right here, I'll put in a clip of the sound I'm talking about. There, you'll hear that. Or maybe you'll hear this sound.
that's the male roaring. Now he doesn't do nothing with the, the, the delivery or nothing like that. All he's interested in is passing on the genetic material. After that, he's not interested in it. But she is, and oh boy is she. And she will come boiling up and get you if you get anywhere near that nest. So you're in something like this, this low ground, these swampy areas. It's, man, it's so nice and secluded in here. Wow, I need to, man, that, that, that's got to be a good fishing hole right yonder. Yeah, she thought so too. So you come in here, you're extra, extra careful this time of year, easing long, because she's going to stay on that nest up until them babies are born. She's waiting for a sound, a sort of sound, kind of like that, that the babies make. And she's going to dig them up, and she's going to catch them up in her mouth. She's going to go put them in water till she gets all of them. And then she'll stay in the area and guard them as they swim around their little nookery. That's one reason she wants this kind of protected little wetland area. Some place where those, you know, baby gators can hide and, and not be instantly taken out by some big fish or something. Some place where she can keep an eye on it. So therefore, she's looking. So when we're walking through this type of stuff, if you look over and you see a six, eight foot circle of cleared out area in the middle of it's a pile of leaves, Give that sucker a wide berth and realize that probably between there and the water is where she's going to be. Don't go messing with her. Don't think, well, I just want to, uh-uh. There's a reason they've survived as many million years as they've had. They fight that tenaciously to survive. And you're, you're threatening her babies like a bear and a babies. She will come bowling out of that water after you. The first one I ever saw was I went down to a fishing hole that I had used many, many times. You know, no big deal. We've been down there. We called it Porter's because it was on Porter Lunsford's land. Wasn't hardly any gators around back in them days. It's back in the 80s. So I went down there and I got out of the truck and I hiked down there and I was going to be there right at daylight and there was some of the best shell crackers with that little stream dumped into the river right there. There was a hole probably 20 foot across and oh man, was there shell crackers in there. And I come down there with my cane poles and everything. And there at the end of the trail was one of those mounds. And I didn't pay it any attention. And I was just about within like one stepping range of it when she boiled out of that water at a dead run. And it was only I threw, the fact that I threw down tackle boxes and everything and went steeply uphill in a hurry it's sort of big getting down in there um was kept me from getting bit because she was coming um but she wanted to protect her babies and i didn't go back and get that tackle until after them babies was gone and nobody else did either but you got to learn about that type of stuff so that's the basic idea of this guys being aware this time of year as you're being out here it's a great time to be out here hiking and enjoying the deep south but you got to be aware of the things that go on mosquitoes everywhere there are clouds of them some days it's so bad it just it drive you nuts so you just have to constantly keep applying stuff and do what you can to make you not as attractive and there's plenty of information on that on the internet about what colors not to wear and <laughs> even what kind of toothpaste to use so as you don't attract thought I heard a low hum of yellow jackets but I was wrong but we ease along and we enjoy it but you gotta keep your eyes open because everything in nature right now is in a big hurry they're trying to reproduce find that girlfriend have those babies and do what they can to beat the curve and so they're busy and they don't need you interfering so when you set up your camp a is this place going to be a bad place for snakes b is this place going to be a bad place for mosquitoes or ticks or whatever that bottom we were just in down there where i was talking about alligators you think there's some skeeters in there Right now, here it is about oh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Hear that farm truck rattling up that dirt road up, you know. 
Right now it's not so bad. You wait till right at dark when a certain UV level hits and the mosquitoes will just appear out of nowhere and it will be just unbearable. If you haven't got something with a mosquito net to get under, you're going to get eat. That's all there is to it. Trust me from someone who spent a lot of years getting eat out there. That you just come home and your face be swollen from so many mosquito bites. Pockets of standing water everywhere. Just tailor made for it. Now, also something else you gotta consider. Wild hog. Down here in the south we got a lot of them. The good news is they're not subtle. They normally don't just sneak up on you. They walk along like they are king of the jungle and they don't mind making a lot of racket when they do. So you'll hear stuff moving and rooting and breaking, especially when they've found them a good source of food and they're rooting around and doing the standard old pig noise stuff. You'll know it's them. What to do? Well, they have fantastic sense of smell, fantastic sense of hearing, lousy eyesight. And that's where they run into the problem where you look up there and see them 75 or 100 yards out and go, oh, pigs. And they're not domestic pigs. They act more like the difference between a, is a grizzly and a black bear the same thing, only very loosely. Well, that's the same thing with Russian boars. The Russian boar down here can have 10 inch tusks and be up to a thousand pounds and be look like a small car standing there. On the other hand, most of them are not nearly that size, but they travel in packs. And you piss off one, and they'll all come after you trying to run you off. And you don't run real fast in the woods like they do. So the thing to do, make a human noise. Talk, laugh, clap your hands, start singing, bang two pots together. Make a human noise, and they'll avoid you because they know you're there. But if you spook them, i.e., you just sit there and they wander up to you get within their visual acuity of probably like 15 or 20 yards or less. Then they go <gasps> and they come at you to get rid of you. So best to just if you think or there is some or I think that's some, go ahead and just make a noise. Yodel, rebel yell, clap your hand, riddle rattle, and carry a bear bell with you. I know several people have done that. And use it for a way to thwart them off. Now we do, do have bear, bobcat, and mountain lion down here. They're ghosts. You won't see them. They make a living how, out of avoiding human contact. If you're lucky, really lucky, you'll see them crossing a trail ahead of you or on the far side of a field or valley or something. But the odds of having a problem with them pretty pretty low but not zero alligators this time of the year will travel and like i said she wants to get there for that swamp area but i have seen alligators fully a mile a mile and a half from a water source before why he's traveling or she's traveling there isn't a mate in here there is, you know she is the dominant queen of this little two acre lake over here and there ain't no male but three miles that way there is and somehow she knows it and so she will travel that three miles walking like a dog get up on all fours and just walk you know until she gets there slide into his pond and they'll do the business and then she'll head back to her pond to have her babies i mentioned years ago of a camp out in a bad driving storm where I'd slung up a hammock and uh, one come walking down the road in that storm during the middle of the night and almost walked into my camp because I was kind of cross, I was slung between two trees across a little dirt road in the backwater of nowhere and I guess it was taking the path of least resistance just like we did and it walked down the trail and I happened to have a hammock across it so luckily you know cooler tempers prevailed and nobody got bit so things worked out. So, any other things you got to be aware of down here in my beloved south? Heat. Right now, we're having 
and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, guys, the best spring I've, I've had in my life in South Alabama. Uh, it was 55 degrees yesterday morning, and here it is the 15th of May. You cannot grasp how radically that is different than what I'm used to. It should be 100 degrees right now with 90% humidity. You know, the night should not barely get under 75. And yet here it was. It was, it was like spring. I mean, I mean like fall. I mean, I was coming out and have to wear a jacket in the morning. I was just tickled to death. And so I got out and enjoyed this. But I'm telling you, the heat is coming. We know the heat is coming. So you have to be very hydrated. Do you have plenty of water? Do you have a water system that you have the ability to, re to reload at first opportunity? Like I use a grail. And people say boiling water. And I did that for God knows how many years. But the problem with boiling water is the ambient air temperature around you right now is 101 and the humidity is like 85 percent and you can bring a canteen cup of water to boil and boil it for the two minutes it needs to and put it out there and set it down and that sucker will still be hot an hour from now or you can go back and sit it into the creek and wait a half hour for it to cool down enough to be able to drink it and not feel like you're drinking scalding hot water that's a long time to wait on water. I've done it. The grail or some sort of filter is a far better thing because you've got to stay hydrated out here. Blisters, ticks, come prepared to deal with them. First aid, come prepared to deal with minor scratches, cuts and things from briars, cat thorns, etc. Wear you a hat to keep the sun off of you. Wear something that's got long sleeves so you can roll those sleeves down to try to protect you from sunburn. Some sort of sunburn cream is a great asset this time of year because our sun is just merciless down here uh, for most of the year. And people go, oh, I, I, I just tan, I ain't going to worry about it. And then then be cooked to a crisp that night. People can get sun poisoned. People can get just so sick from it. So it's something you got to be aware of. You need to learn what are the warning signs of heat exhaustion. What are the warning signs of heat stroke and how to treat both of them. If you don't have anything on it, and you don't want to do in-depth research, I recommend the Boy Scout First Aid Manual. It deals extensively with such things. Because you need to know what you got to do when you or somebody else. If I start getting irritable, if I start getting that headache, it's like everything's too bright. I'm probably dehydrated. And that's a big bad thing. During the heights of the day, you don't travel a lot in the heat. You try to find a way to move around when it's cooler. So plan on moving in the morning. During the heat of the siesta, say from 2 to 4 o'clock, shut down. Get your place in the shade, set up your hammock, chill out, and just wait till after 4 o'clock because the sun drops lower and the shadows get bigger. During the height of like July and August, from about 12 o'clock to 3 or 4 o'clock, because that's the hottest part of the day and the sun just seems to be straight up. There is no shade worth mentioning. So it's just best to hike in the morning, shut down for the midday, and then hike some more in the evening to your final destination plan on shorter hikes and have a plan have your clothing set up so like I mentioned earlier I can change clothes at night because when I get to bed and it's time to go to bed I've got here I've shut down my usual procedure is I get to camp I get all my camp done I do whatever cooking I'm going to do for the night and I rest and I cool down and right after dark, when the temperature starts to drop just a little bit, is when I take my bath. I'm normally going to be next to a water source. And using some sort of rag or wet wipes, if you're carrying them, that's when you go wash the sweat off. Get it off of your crotch area. Get it out of your armpits area. Those places tend to gall, and you tend to get a lot of blistering and chafing. So get rid of that sweat. Okay? Then I change into my night clothes and they're bone dry. 
All I'm going to do in them is sleep. Nothing else. So then in the morning, when I get up, I'll have my breakfast, get my little jump start with my coffee and my Pop-Tart or whatever I'm doing, and I'll get rolling. And then, get ready to roll, I should say, and then I'm going to change back into those wet, nasty clothes. This jungle fatigue shirt will be just sopping wet when I take it off in the summer. And so I'll rig it up. I'll put a string with a long stick like a coat hanger and I'll hang it up in the breeze. Just put the top button on so it turns in the breeze and try to try to dry it out during the night. Same thing with my pants, you know. I'll hang them up by the, the uh, legs with the uh, waist at the bottom and try to dry them that way. Turn them inside out, whatever I gotta do to try to dry them. It ain't gonna dry a lot. I'm gonna tell you straight up because it's so hot and so humid, but it will be a little bit better. Those are what's called, the, what an old Marine called, the Erky clothes, E-R-R-K-Y. meant they were wet and nasty and horrible, and you knew it. But you got out of them, you cleaned up, you slept good, you put everything up, you put your Erky clothes back on, and you shoved off again. Tonight, you'll have those dry clothes to put back on. And you can do several days with those dry clothes before you have to wash them. So, keep that in mind. Well, guys, that's enough for this episode. I hope this uh, gives you some ideas. Get out and enjoy it. Life is short. Living in a, a cubicle or living in a little old apartment just ain't living to me. You need to get out and see it, experience it. Get a little hot, get a little cold, get a little thirsty, get a little sunburnt, get a little bit but see it, have the stories, enjoy it. And what you need is the basic knowledge like I passed on today of what gear do I need and what do I need to keep my eyes open for when I'm out here. Because once you start looking for those, you'll be amazed what you'll see. I've come around and looked up and found wood ducks, you know, nesting. I've seen woodpeckers up in a dead pine tree, a pileated woodpecker and the babies. I've seen great horned owls asleep up against a tree in broad daylight. Just You wouldn't even notice him. He's such a perfect camouflage, but the wind plucked just a little and I saw his feathers flutter. And then I was able to zone and go, wow, that's a great horned owl. See eagles. See things along the water's edge. That's how you get out and experience and see the beauty of it. And one thing you'll learn when you get good at this is man travels through the wood like a, woods like a stone drunk mastodon. We're the loudest, clumsiest thing in the woods. And once you get to where you're good at being quiet and easing along and not attracting a lot of attention, you'll sit here and hundreds of yards away, you'll hear all that racket and know there's somebody over there because, wow, that's got to be somebody <laughs> because they're so disturbing everything. Uh, if you like this video, guys, please hit that like, share, and subscribe. And thank you very much for supporting my channel. Till next time, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.